On November 23, 1944, the Allied forces arrived in Strasbourg, France. The liberation of the city spelled the inglorious end to one of the Nazi regime's showcase projects, the Reich University Strasbourg. As the German Reich University Strasbourg was to be the breeding ground for the new European elite, the Germanophile European elite. In the midst of the Second World War, the men leading Germany's scholarly and scientific efforts joined forces here. Their mission was to spread Germanic thinking to the West, but it was a criminal enterprise. Professors from the medical faculty conducted experiments on human beings, ostensibly for research. They claim they had to obey orders, but that's not true. It was the doctors themselves who asked for backing for their experiments. The man in charge of the medical faculty was its dean, Professor Johannes Stein. Johannes Stein was my grandfather. Sunday, November 23, 1941. A year and a half after the German invasion and the fall of France, the Reich University was inaugurated in Strasbourg. Amid pomp and pageantry, a detachment of the German armed forces marched into the main university building. They carried with them regimental banners from the imperial era and from the Nazi regime. They were followed by parades with students from the imperial era, wearing traditional fraternity uniforms and bearing flags, together with military units. It was a major event, something like 800 people were invited. The ceremony was also attended by many Berlin functionaries, as well as Gauleiter Robert Wagner and SS officer and appointed mayor Robert Ernst. Reichserziehungsminister Rust gab in seiner Rede der festen Zuversicht Ausdruck, dass diese Universität an der Grenzscheide zweier Völker zu ihrem Teil an der Befreiung und Einigung Europas mitwirken werde. Seated at the front were 71 faculty deans and professors. They'd been brought to Strasbourg to provide the Germanic face to the newly established Reich University on French soil. Like the Reich itself, the university was intended to last a thousand years. The regime planned that it would eventually eclipse even the Sorbonne in Paris. With Germany still in the midst of war, the university president, Karl Schmidt, was in a combative mood. Es gilt gerade hier, von Straßburg aus das zu überwinden, was oft und lange deutsches Denken und deutsches Fühlen überwuchert und überfremdet hat. Wir wollen auch den Westen durch unsere geistige Kraft überzeugen und, wenn möglich, für Europa gewinnen. Unser geistiger Kampf bewegt sich auf der gleichen Linie, auf der sich heute der Kampf der Waffen bewegt. August Hirt, who was to head the Anatomical Institute of the Medical Faculty, was also in attendance. At the opening ceremony, he first met Wolfram Sievers. Sievers was Reich manager of the Ancestral Research Agency, co-founded by Heinrich Himmler, head of the notorious SS. The organization was tasked with providing scientific proof to support the Nazis' racial doctrine. Sievers had heard about Hertz's research, and the two wasted no time agreeing on what would become their murderous collaboration. They were extremely interested in talking to each other. This was not just an amicable meeting at the opening ceremony. It was about research projects and making introductions, very practical common interests. Just three months later, on February 9, 1942, August Hirt presented Wolfram Sievers of the Ancestral Research Agency with a concrete proposal for research. We have extensive skull collections for practically all races and peoples. The number of skulls available from Jews, however, is so small that studies cannot deliver dependable conclusions. The war in the East now gives us the opportunity to remedy this deficit. 
From the outset, the Anatomical Institute in Strasbourg was a center for inhuman experiments, planned and perpetrated within a university setting. Sitting in the front row at that opening ceremony was Johannes Stein, my grandfather. As dean of the medical faculty, he bore responsibility for everything that happened there. What was his response to Hirt's plans? Even on family photos, he always posed in uniform. Later, after the war, our family would say that he was only a fellow traveler to the regime, far too absent-minded and cerebral to be involved in anything political. His daughter, Karin, is my mother, and she suspected that this couldn't be the whole story. We two youngest children, I suspect, were the Nazi children. Because back then, families were expected to have five children, not just three. I adored my father. He was so wild and full of ideas. There was never a dull moment with him. And I enjoyed that. Alsace. In Nazi propaganda, it was German land since time immemorial. For centuries, the region next to the Rhine River had been fought over by Germany and France. Between 1871 and 1945, the territory changed hands four times between the two countries. For the Nazi regime and many Germans, Strasbourg was a place of myth, a lost paradise. The fall of France in 1940 installed Germany with renewed nationalist fervor, pride and satisfaction. On June 20th, Strasbourg was occupied by German troops. Hitler visited the city in person and visited the cathedral, for many Germans, a symbol of German culture and German history. The National Socialists laid claim to Strasbourg. Place Kleber, the city's central square, was renamed Karl Rosplatz after a pro-German leader of the autonomist movement. Germany's academic elite were eager to follow on the heels of the military triumph. The Germans had returned and Strasbourg was a lucrative proposition, not just financially, but in terms of it being a desirable destination for many German professors. Prior to his assignment to Strasbourg, Johannes Stein lived in Heidelberg, where he enjoyed a successful university career. Following the Nazi seizure of power in 1933, the university was brought into line with the regime. All Jewish professors were dismissed, with my grandfather's active involvement. Johannes Stein is an example of an academic who furthered his career under the Nazis. It was only after 1933 that he was granted a full professorship at Heidelberg University. As university chancellor and vice-rector, he assumed a very active role in the school's policy-making. On May 1st, 1933, my grandfather joined the SS, opening the doors for his career advancement. In an official party assessment, my grandfather was described as extremely capable and talented, and as a man who ranked among the leading National Socialist professors. In the summer of 1940, he began making regular visits to Strasbourg. Here he met future university president Karl Schmidt and Ernst Anrich, who would later become dean of the philosophical faculty. Together, they made all professorial appointments in accordance with Nazi racial concepts. Scholarship was to serve the German people and draw its inspiration from so-called Germanic culture, so the university was not a place of pure scientific research. It was subject to the ideological principles of blood and soil. The three men lived in the best hotel in town, situated on the renamed Karl Horstplatz. This was also where they interviewed potential candidates. 
they often occupied a table at Restaurant Valentin until late into the night. Legal scholar Ernst Rudolf Huber was among those invited to Strasbourg for a preliminary interview at the restaurant. He described the evening in his memoirs. The meal was of a sumptuousness beyond anything we knew. The white Alsatian wine, a superb burgundy, an elegant champagne, and in between, the brutal Armagnac. Ernst Rudolf Huber was a preeminent legal expert serving the Third Reich. His most significant work was a synthesis of Nazi constitutional law, which sought to provide a legal underpinning for the regime. The book was typical of Huber in that it was an overwhelming compilation of material. He was a perfectionist in many respects and tried to take everything into consideration, including regulations that, for example, addressed the exclusion of Jews. The decree also determines who is to be regarded as a citizen of German or related blood. Jews are precluded from being Reich citizens. Huber enjoyed an outstanding academic reputation and became the advisor for the appointments to the new faculty of law. There were a range of players in this game, some of whom knew nothing about each other while others competed with their rivals. The one area where there was commonality was that the faculty was supposed to fulfill three main criteria. The professors had to be the type of men who would assimilate to what was expected of them, strong in their field and politically reliable. And that was maintained with very few exceptions. The positions were eventually filled, and the university opened its doors in the fall of 1941. The course catalog reflected Nazi ideology, ancient Germanic sagas, racial eugenics, and military medicine. Johannes Stein, the only professor to always hold his lectures in uniform, was head of the largest faculty. Half of the university's students were studying medicine, Field doctors were in huge demand because of the war. If you look at the university's budget, this accounted for almost half of the total. The medical division was probably the most important one. The faculty was endowed with state-of-the-art technology. An electron microscope was ordered for biomedical research purposes, one of only two in the whole of Germany. Here, too, the aim was to demonstrate German superiority over France. 28 professors worked at the faculty. The professors were all luminaries in their fields. They were also all actively involved in the Nazi party or in the SS or SA, which was not the case at other German universities at this time. The head of the Anatomical Institute, August Hirt, also became a member of the SS in 1933. He was a leading scientist. Prior to his work in Strasbourg, he had already conducted experiments on animals with battlefield mustard gas. The Racial Heritage Agency backed what they called functional military research. Here it was soon granted official permission from Berlin to carry out tests on human subjects. Natzweiler Struthof, 55 kilometers southwest of Strasbourg in the Vosges Mountains, was the only concentration camp run by the Nazis on French territory. The specific location of Natzweiler was chosen because an SS engineer had found a block of granite here. He figured it would be a good idea to mine the area to provide material for buildings and monuments of the Third Reich, in particular for Hitler's Nuremberg complex. Camp inmates had to perform forced labor in grueling conditions. Most were political prisoners, communists and so-called enemies of the Reich from both Germany and occupied countries. The remaining prisoners were mainly homosexuals and Sinti and Roma. August Hirt was a regular visitor. 
This is where he would find the people he would exploit for his experiments with mustard gas. On November 12, 1942, he conducted his first experiments. He took about 15 prisoners and administered them drops of mustard gas under their arms. After giving them an antidote, he then observed the reaction as the days and weeks progressed. In those three months of testing, there were three fatalities, three Germans. At the same time, he continued working on his Jewish anatomical collection. Hirt wanted Jewish prisoners for what he called his skeleton collection but there were none at the Natzweiler camp. So on November 2, 1942, the Ancestral Research Agency in Berlin sent a request to the Auschwitz extermination camp asking for inmates. They were to be brought to Natzweiler, wrote the agency's manager. Had my grandfather ever been to a concentration camp? Was he aware of what Hirt was planning? In June 1941, the Stein family moved to Schillerstrasse 7 in the northeast of Strasbourg. It was a lovely old house with a large hallway and the chair where my father always had his officer's cap when he was there. I remember that very clearly. My father would put us two little ones on the grand piano one on the right, one on the left, and tell us made-up fairy tales while playing the piano. Everything lovely about my childhood was because of my father. That's why I simply couldn't fathom that he'd been one of those Nazis. There were things I read about him that I thought impossible. Germans in occupied Strasbourg had a comfortable life. The professors moved into large, vacated buildings in the leafy university quarter. Ernst Rudolf Huber also lived in a sumptuous villa with his family. People didn't care who might have lived there beforehand. That house or apartment was now their home. Strasbourg was now the stage for regular military processions on the city's major streets and squares. The German occupiers were eager to demonstrate that Alsace was now theirs. Local residents were divided. Not everyone was opposed to the Germans. The issue was one that split entire families. Many residents signed up voluntarily to join the SS and the German armed forces. School lessons were now taught entirely in German. At the Reich University, the proportion of local students rose to almost 40 percent. Like their German counterparts, they had to provide a certificate of Aryan heritage. For many, the occupation had become an unremarkable part of their daily lives. The turning point came in the autumn of 1942 with the conscription of young Alsatian men to the armed forces, the Wehrmacht. They were then drafted progressively by age group. Beginning with the forced recruitment, local people began to distance themselves from the Reich University. A group of young students from the Alsace region decided to actively challenge compulsory conscription. They formed a resistance group called the Front de la Jeunesse d'Alsace. Their leader was literature student Alphonse Adam. A handsome man. His sister, Pelagie Zemon, is now 89 years old. Together with Mireille Hinker, whose husband also fought in the resistance, she looks at old photos. She remembers how her brother Alphonse was warned of the Gestapo's plans to arrest him. I was at home. Two men arrived. They were young. And they asked if my brother was home. They said, tell him he has to get out of here, because otherwise he'll be arrested. The resistance group organized hiking trips in the Vosges Mountains. 
In reality, they were smuggling young men who wanted to escape the draft across the main ridge and into central France. Anyone who wanted to join the Catholic-oriented resistance group had to swear an oath before the French flag and the crucifix that they would follow the network's rules. At night, the group's members distributed leaflets, calling on the Alsatian population to engage in open resistance. No decent Alsatian will turn up at the conscription board. Every one of us must refuse to sign up. The governor of the region, Gauleiter Robert Wagner, was outraged, which in turn spurred the group to carry out further operations. Eventually, they were betrayed by one of their own members, and from then on, they worked under terrible risk. In September 1942, a young scientist moved to Strasbourg from Berlin, Karl Friedrich von Weizsäcker. Since he was not a member of the Nazi party, the 30-year-old theoretical physicist had faced a lengthy wait before being appointed professor. It was Weizsäcker's first professorship and a promotion. He had previously been working at the Kaiser Wilhelm Research Institutes. He was an important member of the Uranium Association, the German Association for Research on Nuclear Energy and the Atomic Bomb. He personally registered a patent for the production of a plutonium bomb. Weizsäcker's research team successfully applied for a neutron accelerator. It was housed in a specially built facility on the medical faculty's grounds. The neutron accelerator was to be used by both physicists and the biomedical researchers. But the project was beset by problems from the outset, especially with the electricity supply. The research results from the Strasbourg neutron accelerator basically amount to nothing because the device did not arrive until late in the war, too late. During the time in which the device was operational, they were able to produce a small amount of radioactive phosphorus, but it was only operational for a couple of hundred hours, so basically not at all. Many of the cutting-edge devices at the Reich University were used only briefly, if at all. Following the liberation of Strasbourg in 1944, one of America's priorities was to examine the results of the university's nuclear research, but they found little of substance. After the war, Weizsäcker moved away from nuclear research, instead devoting himself to more philosophical issues. In Strasbourg, Weizsäcker, like many of his colleagues, took up residence in a villa in the northeast of the city. He was joined by his wife, Gundelena, and their three children. I can still remember this big house we had in a big garden. I can still see the chickens running around. I remember we were happy there. We had a happy childhood. Living next door to the Weizsäckers was anatomist August Hirt and his family. Relations between the two families were not always congenial, Gundelena von Weizsäcker would later tell her daughter. Professor Hirt would come by and talk about the characteristics of different nations. When it came to the Germans, he said, come on, we wouldn't hurt a fly. That made my mother's blood boil. She said, but Professor Hirt, you know exactly what's going on in the prisoner of war camps for Russians. And he answered, so you're one of those people who listen to the BBC, which was strictly forbidden. Later, my mother would always tell us that for weeks she was scared the Gestapo would come to our door one day and take her away. Despite their differences, the professor's families would visit and invite each other over. Their sense of being a part of a Nazi elite lent them a feeling of solidarity. My own family was on friendly terms with Professor Hirt. And as for that terrible Hirt, what we later found out, 
Das war auch sehr nett. Once we were celebrating Aber Easter at his place and it was all very nice. Although I didn't like the look of him. Typ. Aber es war sehr nett bei We ihm had a very nice time. We had to climb trees and hunt for eggs. Und Eier suchen und so. At the Notzweiler concentration camp, the prisoners lived under catastrophic conditions. Physical abuse, hunger, and disease were the norm. All of this was ignored by the doctors from the Reich University who continued their research. In addition to August Hirt, two other professors from the racial hygiene department were granted permission by the Racial Heritage Agency to carry out human experiments. Virologist Eugen Hagen was working on a treatment for typhus. Otto Bickenbach tested the poison gas phosgene in experiments that became ever more horrible. Otto Bickenbach used only people who had been deported for racial reasons, those who were classified as gypsies. Sixteen Sinti and Roma had survived Hagen's typhus experiments, and of those, eight were subsequently used by Bickenbach for new experiments. They were treated like animals. A gas chamber was located near the barracks in which the prisoners lived. It had been built in 1943 to hold Professor Hirt's collection of Jewish skeletons, but Hirt was not yet ready to take occupancy. August Hirt had numerous problems. There was no elevator for the corpses and nothing for removing the fat from the corpses. He faced a wide range of problems which led to delays in his project. As a result, it was Otto Bickenbach who became the first to use the gas chamber to test his antidote for the phosgene gas on inmates. After being administered the antidote urotropin, the inmates were forced into the gas chamber and had to smash the vials of phosgene on the floor. They were then left to breathe in the gas for 20 to 30 minutes. At a later point, the gas was tested on a group of inmates without the antidote. Four of them died during or as a result of these experiments. One of them was just 17 years old. His name was Adalbert Eckstein. He'd been arrested for the simple reason that the Nazis objected to his ancestry. Pelagie Simon, the sister of young resistance member Alphonse Adam, was 13 years old at the time. She and her brother lived just outside Strasbourg. She was still asleep when the Gestapo raided their home early one morning in January 1943. They said, raus, raus, out, out. I was in bed, it was six in the morning. They forced their way into my room. They wanted to check whether anyone was hiding in the wardrobe. They searched all the other rooms too. I was shaking the entire time out of fear. Her brother Alphonse had advance warning. Together with two other resistance members, he tried to flee across the border into Switzerland. The group failed to reach safety. They were picked up on a train in Baden just before the Swiss border and arrested. They were then tried in Strasbourg at the People's Court, the Volksgerichtshof, by Freisler in person in early July 1943. Judge Roland Freisler wanted to make an example of the students. As president of the People's Court, Freisler was notorious for berating defendants and for his cruel sentencing in what were little more than show trials. Pelagie Simone missed her big brother. Their mother had already died, and their father had left them to live with his new family. For Pelagie, the youngest of the three sisters, Alphonse was a substitute father. While he was in prison, she wrote him a series of letters. Dear Alfonso, often when I feel homesick, I read your loving words. How dearly I would like to be with you. Since we are so alone, I have complete faith that our mother will not forget us and will make sure that you are returned to us. Alphonse wrote in reply, Pelagie, be brave and follow your oldest sister. 
Schwesterchen. Penegy wanted to attend her brother's trial when it began on July 6, 1943, but she was too young and was instructed to leave the courtroom. She was left to wait alone outside. As Freisler unleashed his torrent of abuse, Alphonse Adam said again and again, we are French. Despite his young age, Alphonse Adam refused to be intimidated. It's impressive how such a young man was able to stand up to Freisler. On July 15, 1943, Alphonse Adam and five fellow resistance members were executed by a firing squad. His sister, Pelagie, learned of the news by chance. I was walking the streets when I noticed a Bekanntmachung, a public notice. It said that my brother and his comrades had been shot at 6 o'clock that morning. The young students had fought for their beliefs and for freedom, a commitment that cost them their lives. What was interesting is that the Reich University of Strasbourg was also one of the very few examples of resistance, of political resistance to the Nazi regime. Their resistance has been largely forgotten by historians and quite unfairly so, including in Strasbourg. Meanwhile, the tide had turned on the Eastern Front and the war was also making itself felt in Strasbourg. With fuel and food now in ever shorter supply, daily life became less comfortable. The newspaper provided tips on running a more efficient household. Almost 40% of the professors had now been drafted into service. My grandfather, Johannes Stein, was also sent to the Eastern Front. August Hirt took over as deputy head of the medical faculty. Hirt was not drafted. His research was considered indispensable to the war effort. By that time, he had completed his preparations for the Jewish skeleton collection. His plans now required the selection of inmates from Auschwitz. The inmates were to be in good health. Anthropologist Bruno Bega, a member of the German Ancestral Research Agency, visited the extermination camp in June 1943 to select the candidates. There is no doubt that Hürth and Bruno Beger wanted to exploit the enormous potential provided by Auschwitz. Here they had access to what they termed human material, Jews from all across Europe. In August 1943, 89 Auschwitz inmates from eight different nations were sent to the Natzweiler camp in the Vosges Mountains. Three died during the journey from Poland. The survivors wouldn't live much longer. Beginning on August 11th, 29 women and 57 men were killed with cyanide in the camp's gas chamber. Their bodies were taken by truck to the Reich University's Anatomical Institute while still warm. They were then stored in the basement. Hirt would never complete his project. Strasbourg is the only German university where these kinds of human experiments were carried out. All the other experiments we know about were conducted by SS doctors in concentration camps. But in this case, it was university professors who conducted these deadly human experiments. Hirt's Anatomical Institute was just a stone's throw away from the medical faculty headed by my grandfather. Surely he must have known what was going on at this faculty and had been aware of the murders and human experiments. It's a question to which our family still has no definitive answer. I believe that the murder of 86 Jews who Hurt had ordered from Auschwitz for his skeleton collection was kept secret from other people in the university. In addition to being a university professor, Hurt was also a member of the SS Ancestral Research Agency. So he had his own separate institute, his own SS institute, where he could carry out these murders. In dem er diese Mordtaten durchgeführt hat. Soon, 
So it is possible that my grandfather hadn't known about the murdered Jews, but he certainly must have known of some other crimes committed at the university. On March 17, 1943, Department H of the Institute for Military Research met in Strasbourg. August Hirt and Otto Bickenbach reported on the results of their human experiments. The meeting was attended by Wolfram Sievers and my grandfather, Johannes Stein. There is further evidence suggesting that my grandfather took an interest in research on racial biology. In a letter dated July 16, 1943, he personally supported the idea of carrying out so-called racial examinations on Indian prisoners of war. In June 1944, the Allies landed in Normandy. In Strasbourg, it was clear that the war was drawing ever closer. Many more students were drafted into the German armed forces. The professors were already making plans to bring their families to safety. My parents brought us to my aunt in Lindau. They stayed behind for a while longer. I think they also wanted to find a safe place for their furniture to prevent it from being destroyed should a bomb hit our house. At 3 p.m. on August 11, 1944, Strasbourg experienced its first major air raid. We were in the cellar, and my brothers and sisters stayed in their rooms up in the attic. I ran up and begged them to come down. The Stein family's home escaped damage. But the houses of the Weizsäckers and the Hirts next door on Karl Bernhardstraße were both hit. August Hirt's wife and son were killed. The next air raid came just a few weeks later. My grandmother, Magdalena Stein, had already fled to the Black Forest with the youngest children, Eckhart and Karin. 19-year-old Friederike stayed behind with her father to help out in the house. She then fled across the Rhine River to Kehl, probably on November 22nd, the day before Strasbourg was liberated. My grandfather stayed in the clinic, believing right until the end that Germany would win the war. On November 23rd, he was taken prisoner by the Allies. The German occupation and the Reich University were now history. In my family, my grandfather was always described as merely a fellow traveler, a storyteller who loved music. The fact that he was an active Nazi and supporter of Nazi racial hygiene, who in all likelihood approved of the human experiments, is something that his children still struggle with to this day. Das hat mich it was devastating. My neighbor consoled me and said I should separate my memory of my father from that of Stein the Nazi. It didn't make him a worse father, right? But I never thought him capable of that. I suppose a lot of other people say the same thing. But that's how it is. After their arrival in Strasbourg, Allied troops found the remains of the 86 Jewish prisoners in the basement of the Anatomical Institute. Hirt had dismembered them to cover up the evidence of his crime. When the bodies arrived at the Anatomical Institute, one of August Hertz's assistants, an Alsatian man named Henri Henri Pierre, immediately realized this was the result of criminal action. He secretly made a note of the numbers that had been tattooed into their arms in Auschwitz and recorded them in the Anatomical Institute's register of bodies. Cadavres de l'Institut d'Anatomie. 
The remains of the 86 victims were buried after the war in Strasbourg's Jewish cemetery. Using the numbers recorded by Henri-Henri Pierre, 70 years later, a German historian managed to ascertain the identities of the victims. Now they had names, not just numbers. At its inauguration, the Reich University set itself the mission of spreading Nazi racial doctrine to the West. To accomplish that mission, leading scientists from across the German Reich were brought to Strasbourg. There was no easy separation between pure scholarship and research on the one side and evil Nazis on the other. That would be far too easy. There was a combination of the two, and I believe it's important to realize that. You can't just say it was the stupid people who became Nazis while the intelligent ones kept their distance. After the downfall of the Reich University, None of its professors acknowledged their role as part of the Nazi regime's intellectual vanguard. Most of them continued their careers in science and academia at other institutions. <laughs> <laughs>